as the title says, I'm going to talk on the Urban Green Up Project in Liverpool and how it's it helping to, in a small way really, but um, a little bit, just greening up Liverpool to help improve opportunities for pollinating species. Um, and um, yes, as uh, Gary said, I'm, I'm employed as a data officer for this project. Um, um, and just a brief uh, background to myself, I'm, I'm, I did a PhD in insect uh, pests on uh, willow trees uh, quite a while ago and then went into ecological consultancy and then went back into research through different routes um, and worked into various projects and I got the opportunity to join this project um, last year. Um, although this project started in um, 2017, so I sort of came into it slightly late, but um, so I sort of had to adapt what methodology was there and um, do what was there already, which is fantastic, but it was, it's great to have an opportunity to be part of this project. So, so this project is um, called the Urban Green Up Project. It's an international project um, and with funding funded by the European Union's um, Horizon 2020 um, funding project and it's a, a three partner project with the Liverpool City Council, Mersey Forest and University of Liverpool. So I'll, I'll go through what Urban Green Up is, a quick overview and how it focuses on Liverpool and then focus down more on the insectable and pollinator monitoring. So Mersey Forest, um, uh, probably a lot of you have heard about it, it uh, basically encompasses a lot of Merseyside and West Cheshire and it links right across to the Northern Forest which goes right across to Hull um, and it seeks to be sort of more look at more from trees, sort of, uh, trying to make it look at well-being and community engagement and uh, improving the environment for everyone. Um, University of Liverpool, I'm, I'm based normally in this building here, if anyone can see my mouse up at the university, um, and this is Cargo Bike I <laughs> borrowed for some of the monitoring, and um, I'm based normally in the job, uh, Department of Geography and Planning there. So, and with Liverpool City Council, um, this project links a lot with their objectives, um, such as air quality, climate change, various things like that. So, um, and um, the, the, with the Urban Green Up project, there's various objectives. Um, sorry, the objective is basically to retrofit urban areas and see if that can be replicated um, in mainly European cities, but looking at lots of different partner cities and basically mitigate climate change, improve air quality and water management, such as flood events and um, increase sustainability of our cities to help um, uh, mitigate climate change but, um, but using um, what's called nature-based solutions or MBS or green interventions which is basically green infrastructure by another name. So to reiterate, reiterate um, it's basically looking at a methodology to basically to retrofit cities using these nature-based solutions um, and try and adapt cities to fight against climate change. So we're basically doing a lot of monitoring around that as I explain. So it's basically, as I say, an international project. Um, the front runner cities all are based in Europe. So Izmir in Turkey, Liverpool, and uh, excuse my pronunciation, Valladolid in Spain. And then lots of following us cities um, like Ludwigsburg in Germany, Mantiova in um, Italy, and um, Mendel in Colombia, China, and Vietnam. And then 18 other um, cities in part of the network. So with the focus on Liverpool, um, basically scoping out where to choose to f areas in Liverpool to focus on such and this is scoping match looking at where the greatest need of um, to trap air pollutants is so as you can see it's a focus on the city centre here so hence um, for this the locations chose two areas in the city centre um, this is an area this Lime Street is just there um, an area going right down from near the Liverpool Royal um, Hospital down to the Strand of the waterfront including Williamson Square and the main city centre. And then also another area, um, Baltic area, which is Wapping Dock right up to Bold Street, if people know Liverpool. And there's also an initial area of L1 looking at as well. And then um, quite a nice link in, there's um, various um, pollinator planting going on to the Liverpool, um, so the Prince's Avenue corridor, which nicely links in with the Otterspool area, which is Prince's Park, Sefton Park and Otterspool um, Woods or Otterspool Park. So sort of, several areas to look at. So I'd look into the uh, green interventions related to the environmental monitoring. We're also planting lots of trees, um, shade trees and cooling trees and um, various other things, but I'd, I'm focusing more on anything that's related more what with the monitoring I'm related to and that linked with pollinators and insect of all species. So we've got things in place already. There's um, a green roof, there's um, a removable forest pod, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, a tree, um, sustainable drainage systems, um, 
and which I'll talk about again more, and floating islands, green walls, and new ponds. So on the, this is on the Royal Court Theatre, um, just round the corner here is Lime Street, to give you your bearings in St George's Hall. So this is um, um, the roof on top of the Royal Court Theatre, um, it was installed early, so um, to explain where um, most of the green um, interventions were supposed to go in last winter, and then all the, um, so we had uh, several years of post pre-monitoring, um, including last year, and then this year was supposed to be the post monitoring and then the second year of post monitoring um, next, next uh, year, the year of 2021. But of course, unfortunately, because of coronavirus, um, a lot of things have been delayed. So things are gradually going in, but we are doing what we can and still monitoring. So this went on early though. This is um, the green roof um, here, which is just as it was, the blank state and then put in and all the container plants. And the bug house was on TV. It was on a Channel 4 documentary, Find It, Fix It, Flog It. I think aired last November, um, and that's already on the green roof. Um, though I haven't had a chance to actually see it on the green roof yet, but hopefully soon. And then this is the forest bathing plot. It's sort of basically an idea, it's a little bit of forest in the city that you, um, little mirrors on the inside, you shut the door and it's amazing how sense of sort of almost peace inside. It's a, yeah, so this is designed to move around the city. So it's a great idea. And then these are the um, trees on the strand. So this is the strand, if people don't know Liverpool, this is a major road um, um, dividing the riverfront, the River Mersey from um, the city centre. And um, at the moment the work's going on to put in a segregated walking and cycleway um, and um, lots of new crossings and better crossings across the strand to make it less of a severance. And also we're planting 150 trees as part of the project and um, these 29 tree suds, which I'll explain in a second. So these tree suds are basically connected in series and they basically take water from the road and obviously the tree species that can cope with the pollution from the road, like salinity when the road's salted in winter, things like that, and, and basically flow along and um, it will help with any flood events, but also um, help with the pollution as well on the, on the strand that comes off the various vehicles and etc. So floating islands, which is, um, we've got a nice big island out of Wapping Dock, so do go and see it. And it's basically innovative design um, where they've got um, uh, gravel beds underneath it. They've got um, so refuge fishes, fish, and it's got uh, like little ponds on top which catch the rainwater and various different plants um, which can cope with the sort of salt and um, freshwater conditions, these estuarine conditions. and to help to increase their biodiversity there but also as a big focal point to increase awareness of what you know are green issues and there's basically green routes that we're going to waymark which is from this area up through this is the Anglican Cathedral here in the background but up through to Bold Street which is up there somewhere so it's basically sort of a good focal point. We've got a smaller floating island in Sefton Park um, and this is again um, to basically enhance the environment and this is at a, it's right at the top of the Sefton Park Lake um, where there's two water streams coming into the lake and it's to try and reduce nutrients coming in from those um, water sources and reduce the um, chance of al algal blooms but also to enhance the biodiversity there and here's some geese investigating it here so and this is supported by Friends of Sefton Park as well so and the green walls which is fantastic we've got one of the longest in the UK 65 meters long along the front of St. John Centre, which is fronts um, Queen Square bus station, which is one of the, um, there's two bus stations in Liverpool, this is one of, one of them, which is a really big bus station. So this road where these ladies looking at is full of buses, um, very, very busy with people and buses. So it's, so it's a major focal point in the city and it's a wonderful way area to enhance this, this green stretch of wall here. And they're also putting beehives on the roof and Various, and they're going to be using rain, um, I think it's just about to be linked into rainwater harvesting to, to water the green roof, sorry, green wall. So, uh, and it's wonderful, it's a huge variety of plants. I, was, I managed to get up there yesterday, full of um, Mexican flea vein and, and other um, plants and lots of bumblebees already foraging away and it was a little bit windy, so the hoverflies were hiding on foliage, but it's, it's great. It's a, and it's a real sort of nice green spot, which is fantastic. And as I say, yeah, on the slide, it's um, all the species are chosen in consultation with the Bumblebee Conservation Trust to try and increase, you know, um, plants useful for pollinators. 
and there's another one in the Baltic. Um, this is just on the fronting the whole of a garage, which is wonderful. And it's really green. It's, it's lovely because you can get right up close straight away. And um, it's it got, even got wild, wild strawberries, so people can pick wild strawberries if they want as they're walking along. So, and then we've got new, some new ponds. So this is um, in Ospel Woods. This is on the site of a busy junction. So there's, um, if people know Liverpool, this is Egbert Vale Junction and there's Jericho Lane off here as well. So it's like this triangle top at the, at the very top. And it was basically um, to enhance the biodiversity and reduce flooding here. We put in a little weir to hold the water back, opened it out and, and it will be planted up more. It's literally only just finished, but it's, um, It'd be great so yeah, it's really improve help improve things and then as a pond later lower down in the woods um, this used to flood all the time so this uh, now it's opened up to a nice big um, pond here so this again improved by diversity here so we're still waiting for um, a rain garden to go elsewhere in the baltic which is just on a wide pavement area so um it's sort of help against flooding and improve biodiversity so it's sort of a little picture of what's hopefully will look like and um, yeah so it help improve things and there's also going to be another hopefully another green wall or screen going into Ottspool and then um, so lots and lots of pollinator planting wherever we can fit it and um, along everything like Long Park Road in the Baltic and things like that so fantastic so here just so a, a map overview to um, show where these things the location of these things um, this is the um, one area which has got the green wall and the um, on St John's Centre um, which is near Queen Street Square bus station, as I was talking about, and the green roof. Um, these are where the, the trees are in the Strand. Um, this is showing L1 area as well. And then this is the Baltic area. So you've got the floating island and then linking up. This is the green route going up. Um, lots of pollinator planting, um, the rain garden and the green wall is here. So it's trying to link through and this will be way marked and moved as much as possible. And then linking in with that as close, we've got the um, St. James's um, Gardens here for the Anglican Conservatory. At Anglican Cathedral and then linking with that you've got Prince's Avenue planting here um, which links down here and then this is Prince's Park um, so there's going to be pollinator planting linking Sefton Park and then we've got the floating island and Sefton Park and then uh, uh, some more pollinator planting and hopefully the green screen here for um, um, to link with Ottersford Woods you've got one new pond here the other one here and some a new orchard down here so, it's, so we've got lots of different things going in which is fantastic so all the monitoring around this is essential we need to know if we can replicate this and then of course it can hopefully more and more cities can take this up and and retrofit um, these interventions into their environments and improve um, it for everything so we're doing lots of social economic monitoring um, non-technical um, such as forest schools and community engagement and then um, environmental monitoring which i'm concerned with so just some examples so we're basically looking at footfall health and quality of life any increase in walking and cycling um savings in energy use all sorts of different things um and forest schools and things like that so sorry just going quickly going through those because just give you a brief overview and then this is the social economic monitoring just um there have been workshops and things it's all a little bit on hold unfortunately at the moment but it will be start restarting again um and just basically seeing what people's perceptions of the green infrastructure we're putting in are and and what they like about it and what what they think about it and various um things where we're working with um mersey forest establishing community garden in the baltic the forest schools and then also we're promoting the iNaturalist app um as part of the project um which is an international app um, um and as trying to focus on the various areas they're so here um sorry that that was um, so we're fo focusing on a particular area here with this Baltic Triangle, um, where this is um, this Baltic area and all these different points in here. So we're sort of encouraging everyone. So if you're in the area, so please um, log on to iNatura. So this is an explanatory slide on how it works. Just download the app if you're in the area, please, or in Liverpool area, please um, um, do this because it's great to get our baseline up and we know what's there then and um and it's very easy to use just and it's sort of it's a community-based app so you record your obs observations and then but it does generate useful data for um um so which can be used later on so the environmental monitoring um, um this is what i'm mainly um dealing with it's um look at the air water thermal and um, the biodiversity monitoring 
so air quality this is uh let's briefly talk about these that this is a particulate um, matter a mobile sensor so here i am using it also collecting the locals the, the climatic conditions as well and basically this is at various points around the different areas and around the different um, um, nature-based solutions we're putting in to see what particular matter is at the moment um, at that point in time um, but we're also doing um, diffusion tubes which are look at nitrogen dioxide so they absorb nitrogen dioxide over the month and give you that mean valley value but we're also using increasingly using um, low-cost sensors that can work 24 7 um, recording all the um, different just temperature values but also particulate matter and things like that so um, that gives us more and more data which is fantastic and then water um, is going with the cargo bike in front of the liver building uh, the pier head so here um, we're concerned with looking at what's coming off the roads into the water samples so the water samples are collected here on the strand but also um, in Ospol as well but um, things from vehicles you can get various things from like brake wear and tire erosion so we're looking at those different chemicals but also and metals but we're also just looking at the general quality of the water so we use a probe which basically tells you pH temperature dissolved oxygen etc and then um, and often very dirty water as you can see and then collect the samples of water and then into a chemical is analyzed in the in the lab for um, nutrients and metals and and it's all and just seeing how what's there and um, whether it's improving in time with the various things we're doing. So temperature is using a thermal camera um, and this is just basically showing the temperature difference. So here this is in Williamson Square, this is um, St John's Tower and you can see here this is 40 degrees on the, the surface and then 30 degrees under the trees. It's quite a difference temperature difference um, within the um, just that was some hot day in July last year. And then again, this is on the Baltic Green Wall, so we're starting to see already quite a difference. This is before the Green Wall was put in. So you've got um, a seven degrees different here, difference here, but then um, uh, with the Green Wall in situ, you've got 17 degrees difference. So it's already seeing a difference and you can really feel it when you're up close to the wall, it's a lot cooler and different environment. And obviously this is more important generally um, in continental Europe, but it is increasingly important in, in Liverpool with climate change. So biodiversity monitoring, <laughs> we've all been waiting for. So um, this is the baseline is um, phase one habitat surveys and liaising with um, the local record center, Biobank, and, and basically just collecting lots and lots of data where we can see what's in the area, but also what happens when, where, as we're putting all um, each into green intervention in. So if I look at the intersectoral data first, um, this is a backlogger which has got GPS um, in it as well. So you can basically walk or cycle a transect and um, it collects um, the portions of sound um, um, that might be bats and then you can analyze that later so you take the visual records but also the um, uh, analyze the sound files later on to see what bat species might be present that you might have seen even not seen but um, um, so what there and with the dragonflies of course close focus but not close essential so this is the dragonflies this is um transit through um, Prince's Park, Sefton and Ospel Woods and there's monthly and regular stops and just seeing what's there and um, the floating island is roughly uh, around here so so trying to get um, an idea of what's around there so and our general diversity we've seen lots of azure blues but um, a whole range of different species which is fantastic and that correlates what biobank has found as well and then um, this is um, looking at, again at different species. I've taken out these extreme values, the edge of blues, just make it easier to see um, the different species though. Sorry, it's not as clear as I'd like it to be, um, but you can see there's a greater range of species in Sefton Park and Princes Avenue, sorry, Princes Park, but not really in Ottersville Woods, but hopefully with new ponds, that would change. So this just some pictures <laughs> to, um, so this is a blue tailed, um, these are two azures um, overpositing in pond weeds, so it obviously gives us an indication then or maybe they need to be at more range of plants so they've got more choice of plants to overposit on and this is a black-tailed skimmer. So bat transects, um, a loop round town through the Baltic and this is connecting, seeing what there is, connecting this is Anglican Cathedral Gardens, St James's Gardens right down through to Otis Pool. so seeing what's there, again it's every month and just seeing what's there and what's um, um, if there's any bats and any increase with um, 
um, all the interventions. So during 2019, we obviously got a lot more in hospital, which is expected because it's so much greener. Um, but we've still got one or two in, in the Baltic and um, the city centre area. So BID is the city centre area. And this is showing which we found one in, this is St Nick's um, uh, church gardens on the Strand. And it's possible this is about commuting there. Um, it just sort of, there's nothing, no vegetation there, but it was obviously it's commuting there. There is a roof garden or two, so you, you never know. And one I didn't even see um, down in the Baltic, but I, it was on the an analyzer. So, um, and then, uh, I'm sorry, we look at bat passes for this because it could be the same bat circling around. Um, but yeah, obviously the analyzer collects all these passes as separate um, records. Um, it's very difficult to tell if it's the same bat or a different bat. So it's, um, so we just look at the number of bat passes for now and um, let's see if I can find a way to tease it out later on. And um, yeah, so this is going through Ospol. So, so you can see Sefton Park here, which is the brown, a lot more different passes that we saw. Um, and then, um, so this is general, so sort of trying to tease out the species, but um, this is still subject to change because I'm gradually looking through the sound analysis files and working out what might be different species and the validity, auditing the um, different sound files. Um, but, and a lot of like the unidentified ones in Sefton Park might well be Dorbentons, which fly along the surface of the lake. So um, I need to just double check that. So looking at the floral data, um, this is, um, so basically looking at the whole base level, what's there and around each intervention. But the, like, for instance, this is near the flyover, which has been removed in Liverpool. Nice patch of wildflowers here, so that's nice. But so, and around this is in the Baltic, around the car park there. So the methodology we used was flower insect timed counts, which is established methodology, um, advice um, uh, and um, centre of ecology and hydrology. And but I just basically altered it slightly to um, fit in um, with the project. Um, so I basically sort of assigned my own groupings of pollinators and um, looked included climatic data and floral data. And I did a 10 minute observation count, observational counts and basically looking at the number of diversity of the pollinator species and the abundance and diversity of the plants um, and flowers. So also number of flowers. And we're focusing around this, um, the interventions so and obviously control what else is in with, within the, uh, the areas and define source areas there's like source populations of flowers that might be provide sources for the different interventions. So flower abundance um, throughout each area, um, hospital as expected was quite high, but also the um, center, the bit of center or the city center are pretty high. And the Baltic is um, very low, but hopefully that will increase with all the pollinator planting that will go in. And then just as just an example, the diversity of plant families that within my quadrat samples and, it, and in the Baltic, and this is mainly Asteraceae and Fabiaceae. So Asteraceae are composite flowers and Fabiaceae are more clover type plants. But it, you know, it'd be nice to have a better range, but this is great. So yeah. So looking at pollinators, so <laughs> again, so sorry, <laughs> I had to give you all the background first and then yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, so, so look at the pollinators within the areas. So. So we get found a whole range of orders. Um, obviously, um, um, a lot of Hymenoptera, which causes bumblebees, um, honeybees, and solitary bees, um, primarily, and, and a lot of Diptera, which are primarily hoverflies. Um, but uh, yeah, so a whole range of things. So this to breaking down a little bit more. Um, a high proportion honeybees in various areas, especially in the town centre, and there's a lot of beehives in the centre. So that that's probably why that is so high. Um, and a lot of hoverflies and some pollen beetles in the Baltic. So, it's, but obviously it's very dependent on when I'm doing the samples and where I'm doing the samples and things like that. So it's randomized samples. So a um, whole range, but I'm, I'm still teasing out a lot of the data and working out other, other relationships and things like that. And as we get all the, um, after the invention's gone in, as we get more data, it'd be great to see what relationships are develop. So I just wanted to, finish really with um, some photos and um, sort of and I'll use all your expertise for if you can help with um, identification of a lot of the species I'm saying because um, unfortunately I don't have that much time in the project to really go down to species level I have been in the museum trying to 
and attending various courses, trying to, especially by the Tanipta Trust as well, so trying to um, get my eye in for um, various species. We don't collect specimens in the field, so it's purely, um, I, I need to sort of basically identify them as I can in the field by briefly collecting them in tubes or, um, uh, um, and, or using close focus binoculars or taking lots of photos. So I try and any hints on uh, what features I need to highlight in the photos would be fantastic. And, and yeah, from a, a recent hoverfly course I went on to, I realized that I really need to get the ring wing venation, venation for those. But you know, any features I need to highlight in the photos is fantastic because it really help um, later on. But any help, um, if anyone's willing to help, um, help me sift through my photos to sort of try and work out what species might be that'd be fantastic and also of course if you see any rare rare specimens that I've picked up then please shout as well so so here of course you get bumblebees and honeybees and get lots of photos of those which is fantastic and I've sort of got to grips with the bumblebees but you know the cooker bees I still struggle with a little bit <laughs> and um but then this is uh um, you get solitary bees like this, which um, unfortunately is not a brilliant photo, can't get the wing venation completely. Um, but of course someone might be able to pick out straight away what that is. Um, and I, I, I need to sort of try and work out as much as I can and what it is, but otherwise it has to just stay within its grouping. So it's great for the project if, if you can help um, if us focus on what we've actually got here. So there's um, also lots of hoverflies. So this again, I haven't got the wing venation brilliantly there. But, um, and another one here. Um, and this one I did, I only took yesterday and I managed to get the wing venation quite well in that photo. So it's got nice lots of loops, but I haven't had a chance um, since yesterday to have a look, try and work out what it is. But someone might be able to, I expect one of you, at least will be able to say straight away, oh, that's that. <laughs> so that'd be fantastic if you can help with that. And, um, but you get lots of, this is on um, wild carrot yesterday and it's whole composite range of species. You've got several different flies. You've got a solitary bee here, um, which I unfortunately flew away before I could catch it. So it's just, there's the only photo I've got. And then, you know, all these beetles and, <laughs> and then even, um, yeah, this Hemiptera, I think, I think it's Hemiptera, which is very unusual. I hadn't seen it sucking nectar, but there we go. Yes. Yeah, so, but they, obviously it can, maybe still helping pollinate the plants in some way. And then this brilliant parasitica um, was found yesterday as well. So it didn't seem that interested in the beetles. It was just, I think it was just wandering along uh, using the nectar source, I think. So yeah, but it's fantastic. So it's, it's great seeing all these different things and I'm really enjoying that. And yeah, and, and it'd be great, as I say, if you can help <laughs> identifying some of these species, that'd be fantastic. So anyway, to finish off, just as I stress again, please use this iNaturalist app if you're in the area and just help us improve our baseline and record what's there and it really helps knowing what's there already and obviously that Baltic Pacific area one as well. Um, and my email's here as well, so just please email with me with any questions or comments or feedback, that's be wonderful. And, and also with the Urban Green Up project we have a website and um, you can register for any updates to the project as well, so that'd be great. And, and also Follow us, please. And uh, yeah, we've got um, quite active Twitter, Twitter accounts for Urban Green Up, and and of course various links get um, forwarded all the time from Mersey Forest Local Council and and the university. Um, so that'd be fantastic. So so um yeah, so I hope that it makes sense, and I hope that was useful, and yeah, and and, and I hope that gives the whole overview of the project for you all. So um, any questions? <laughs> yeah. Um Thank you very much indeed, Stella. Uh, I really didn't realise the the amount of uh, <laughs> sort of infrastructure that that was going in. Really, I, I'm going to have to when I'm back in the museum do a <laughs> do sort of go to these different get get the slide up with your map and go to these different <laughs> bits during my lunch breaks. Uh, I think I thought I'd seen the one at St John's. But when did that go in? Um, oh, a few months ago, actually, it went in during lockdown. So, uh, oh, might well, have, okay. yeah, it was might have been April, May, but yeah, they they were focusing on lots of, uh, um, I think there were lots of mock-up pictures going in. So maybe you saw a mock-up picture or. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something. Okay. Um, <laughs> but and, and it was and it's very interesting. You know, it's it, it's quite stark the temperature difference really when you ha add add trees, isn't it? And uh, yes, yeah, definitely, yes. 
It's really quite interesting. I wonder if the first thing we should do is just is just go back through your your, your last few pictures, just in case anyone and and just spend you know <laughs> uh, thirty seconds a minute on each one and just see if anyone has any answers for you. I don't think I do. <laughs> so I was a bit cheeky asking, but it'd be great if uh, any help. For, you know, I, I, I'm doing what I can, but yeah, I'm not. Uh, I'm not a specialist in any of these areas, and a lot of these groups are new to me. So <laughs> that'd be fantastic. So I'll go back. Um, so, <laughs> so any clues, anyone? <laughs> these are all recent, are they? Um, yes. Um, though this might have been last year, actually. Yes, it's. Um, just picked some photos that because uh, some of them are unfortunately are too blurred to use on on a presentation so it's, uh, <laughs> so it's i'm not entirely sure but that that could be one of the base banded furrow bees lazio glossum fantastic yeah i thought it might be lazio glossum but i wasn't sure because it's the right shape for lazio glossum isn't it Although yeah. some, somebody else is saying helictus at the moment i think it, it all depends <laughs> where those where those hair bands are are they uh, at the base of the segment or at the end um and it's pro probably haven't quite got enough detail there to see at the moment well, well, thanks peter and, and richard yeah so, you've got you've got a job in your hands Stella, having to do it all with, with photos <laughs> Yeah, it'd be so much easier with specimens, but that's the way it goes, unfortunately. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, then this is hoverfly. So, yes. Yeah, so, anyone guess of that? Guess of that? <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering about a UPODs species with that E U P E O D E S, um, but I might be wrong. I'd, I'd, I'd have to take it through a key, probably. <laughs> Well, thank you, but it's a good way to start. That's fantastic. Oh, superb. Yeah. Fantastic. So, next one. Yeah. <laughs> so, I should have zoomed in a little bit more. But, yeah. So, no clue. I'll go into the next one. <laughs> so, this one you can see the venation, so I hope that makes it easier. But, um, but as I say, I haven't even managed to pick up a key and look at it yet. So <laughs> I've been too busy since yesterday, but yeah. As everybody says, Aristotelis on that one. Definitely. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Oh, thank you. You're superb. <laughs> That's fantastic. And um, And yeah, this is a whole mix of different things, but yes, yeah, if anyone's got any ideas for these or... <laughs> it's a... um, I mean, those, those soldier beetles, I think they'll be Raganitha. Raganitha, I might be saying that wrong. Rag oh, Rod saying Raganitha Fulda. Um, oh. Fantastic, oh, yeah. Yeah, there were loads of them just on the um, wild carrot. It was fantastic, so... Yeah. Uh, go on to the next one. Yeah, so, so this uh, Hemiptera species, uh, yeah, I wouldn't know where to start for that. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I can always send if someone wants these photos. I can just send them and uh, blow them. Uh, you know, crop them a bit more and try and yeah, make it easier to yeah. So. I'm wondering about Diptera for that actually, whether it's oh, a really? chloropid fly, but it's it's difficult from the from the photo. Oh right, okay, yeah. Because I was thinking with the mouth parts, so I was thinking hemiptera, but yeah, yeah, all right, yeah. No, oh, thank you. <laughs> Gosh, that was that, that was Pete. That actually reminded me of a like a a, a snow flea. That's in the um, sort of lace wings and allies, isn't it? Group. Yeah, there is uh, the, the the face looks a bit like that, but I'm just wondering about the antennae, um, the uh, yeah, and the, the, the sort of the yeah. thorax and scutellum look quite dipter alike, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It'd be nice to see it from above. Yeah, I might have because I took a few photos. I might well have one more from above. So yeah, 
so I could always always send you that if you happy <laughs> to look at it. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, and that, yeah. And this is um, and this parasitic. Uh, yeah, I don't know if anyone knows what that is, but yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I think I think Tony would say that there's, yeah, there's very few you can do from from photos with these. Yeah. That's it, that's it. Oh, cryptony, as in Ooh. self self family. Yeah. Oh, fantastic! So, thanks, Tony. Oh, thank you. Yeah, super. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much, everyone. That's fantastic. <laughs> yes. Helps me give me some hints of where to start. You know, <laughs> Superb, yeah. Okay, we'll, um, we'll go to questions now then, um, Stella. Okay. So, uh, we'll, we'll go to, to William first. Yeah. Uh, I'll... Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yes. thanks, for, thanks for that. Thanks for that. I just want to know, because uh, well done for the presentation, by the way, um, really interesting. I'd just like to know, what is the initial startup costs and what partners do you have for the green wall? And how long is the maintenance on that in terms of um, with the partners that you put and, and the costs? Ooh, um, yeah, unfortunately, there's no one on the call from uh, who would know specifically. Um, um, yeah, I know for the for like the St John's Green Wall, um, um, the, well, both of them is all the partners, obviously Liverpool City Council, but um, um, and St John's Centre for the St John's Green Wall, and the garage is actually council owned, so that's. Um, um, but I think it, uh, it is managed by Iliad, um, who run own a lot of property in that area. So I, I'm not quite sure, unfortunately, with the questions uh, the partners for that, but. Um, um, I can send you um, or Juliet Staples, who's the contact within the city council. She 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 knows um, she know the answer to every question like that, which is for, uh, so it's worth contacting her. Um, or I can forward you um, um, your e um, her email. Or, yeah. Um, or so yes, yeah. But you well, contact. That'd be great. Thanks. And uh, basically, maintenance costs. I think it's um, they're maintained for quite a long time. They're sort of yeah. Um, the companies which set them up. Um, I think it's. It's um, by a texture, I think was the green wall uh, for both green walls. Um, and uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're responsible for the maintenance, um, at least initially, but I'm not sure how long that goes on for. And, um, but yes, as I say, Juliet Staples is the person to ask for that. So well, I can put you in contact and yeah, should we have to answer that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so a question from Rod. Um, have you tried moth traps? Is the, le the lepidoptera percentage on your on your on your graph seems a bit small? Yeah, good question. Yes, yeah, um, yeah. Unfortunately, I haven't done it because it's literally just doing these quadrat samples, and um, yeah, unfortunately, I've been not given very much time for the monitoring. So it's it, so it's very much fitting in what I can within the time. So it's um, yeah, it, yeah. It'd be great to have more moth traps and look at nocturnal moths, um, pollinators as well, and which is obviously really important. So um, it'd be really good to do an overview. I mean, we have been trying to link in with various student projects and things like that to try and um, increase the scope of the project. Um, um, so if you know anyone who might be able to do that, that'd be fantastic. It'd be great to know what's there and um, and to do that. Um, but unfortunately, I don't really have time within my monitoring. Um, time budget unfortunately which is a real shame because I'd love to <laughs> so yeah but that's a really good good point that yeah okay was was there any any follow-up to that Rod or are you are you on yeah yeah okay um you could possibly try records uh Richard or someone like that might be able to help out the local records and where they're submitted from. So you could get the records by proxy. Yeah, so I, I should have mentioned, we are sort of looking at the records from the biobank, from the local record centers biobank um, for the area. And um, so we are using that area, but I was just showing what's um, the data oh. from my quadrats for that. But yeah, but yes, yeah, it's a really good point because I, I, yeah, It'd be nice to uh, yeah. I need to correlate the data more with that, but um, 
for what records they have. And but I think they've had very uh, scarce records in some areas within Liverpool because yeah. obviously people focus on the parks and <laughs> and mm. not on not on little bits of wildflower patches or whatever. So so it'd be nice to have more people recording and what, what what's there. Um, because I know in the Wapping Dock area, they've already found um, from focusing on the area some some rare species, which is great. So um, there's a lichen species and things like that. So yeah, so, so it'd be great to have more focus. <laughs> so so we will be um, but planning to do bio blitzes of the areas. So um, um, particularly the Baltic area. So um, do watch out for that. And I can obviously forward the details um, to Gary and others so so it can be passed around the details to people so you can join in if you can so obviously these are a little bit on hold at the moment so but hopefully we can go ahead with those soon okay. yeah I, I would imagine it's quite problematic to to have a light trap in the center of Liverpool uh, I'm not sure <laughs> I would want to myself you could maybe but, um, put one on a roof and uh, yeah yeah, yeah. Um, but yes yeah, quite Especially a mercury vapor, you'd you'd probably not use that. That would uh, keep a lot of people up, I would imagine. But um, yeah, th there must be there must be pollinators going on, happening at night time as well. A question from Mary: What is the name of the iNaturalist project? And Mary's suggesting that uh, it's promoted on the Mersey Biobank Facebook group. Ah, uh, yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, I, I, I've yeah, I, so it's um. So there's a Mersey Biobank uh, um, Facebook group, is that? Yes, yes. It's... If you could send me the link for that and I'll, I'll forward the details to whoever administrates that or do you know a link I can send? I can, I'll, I'll send you that, Stella. I think Ben, ben Deed okay. ma manages that. Oh, okay. I, I know Ben Deed. Yes, yeah. Okay, so, yeah. Fantastic. Um, uh, and... <laughs> From uh, Richard is Richard. You're you're asking if we can have a tnip today out to survey the project. Uh, oh yes, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> I mean, it would be nice to go into Liverpool actually uh, for once. Um, yes, um, we'll, we'll we'll have a think about that, Richard. We'll uh, I'll certainly um, maybe go out with, uh, with with colleagues on lunchtime. Maybe you could uh, you could you could join us for some walks and we'll we'll have a look. Um, but it might be uh, it might be winter before <laughs> we're allowed back at our desks. I'm not yeah. sure. So, um, but I, yeah, it's certainly with, with all this, all these uh, sort of green areas in the in the city. I'm going to be especially looking at the green walls if they're if they're got lots of species for for bumblebees and things. It'll be it'll be really nice to be able to do that. Actually. Um, I'm just mm -hmm. looking for any more questions. Oh, a question from Pauline. Um, Stella, are you recording any invasive plants on your monitoring visits? Um, well, if they're within my quadrats, yes. Yeah, so I'd be recording anything that's there within um, my quadrats. But um, obviously for my quadrats, I'd choose a random point and then and move to the nearest patch of flowers so it's so it's if if it's not flowering i might not be recording it so um if it's not within the quadrat and not within the flower patch <laughs> so it, uh, with my meter squared quadrat so i suppose i'm quite limited with uh, the scope of that but um obviously though um biobank will hopefully have those records of any invasive plants um going in and and i hope that be recorded anyway so um yeah, there's 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 a couple of nice verges near the near the museum, isn't there, Tony? Where there's there's bee orchids and things, which is really nice to see in in the summer. Obviously, the the wild flower meadow at the front of World Museum has gone gone from strength to strength, really. And there's you know there's been new butterflies being recorded. I think they had um, small coppers have been in there. Um, have they had common blue, Tony? Um, I think so. Yeah, um, there's, there's, it's, it seems to be uh, attracting quite a lot. So um, we we ought to get out there more on uh, on workshops at, at, at lunchtime and, and just go around there. We we have used it before, but there's a that's a, that's a, that's a really nice area. But um, I'm just going to go back to 
question. So, uh, so a question from, from Pete. Is there a contact in Liverpool City Council regarding biodiversity? Um, so many missed opportunities along Otterspool waterfront um, and Riverside Drive. Yeah, that's a difficult one, really, because we're um, yeah we're sort of looking, um, obviously coordinating with Biobank um, and um, and Lancashire Wildlife Trust as well. So Fiona, um, uh, what's his name, Robertson, is it? Yeah, from Lancashire Wildlife Trust and um, Ben Deeds, um, they are helping us with um, promoting the iNaturalist project and um, um, app and and um, sort of organising the bio blitzes and things. So it's um, so I suppose they would be really the people to contact um, because they're, they're linked with their project in a small way and, and um, they are, you know, obviously collecting any records from, from the Liverpool area, but... Um, um, so I'm, I'm not, uh, Pete, I'm not sure exactly what, what you meant with your question, but is it, is it about, is, is there someone responsible for biodiversity in the city council that, because obviously there's, the um, there's a, the, the regulations that are trying to meet meet targets, aren't they? You know, for um, you know increasing biodiversity and halting losses. Is, is that what you mean, Pete? Is someone is someone sort of responsible for those? Yeah, yeah. I've been. I mean, I've been a bit of a, a critical, a bit of a thorn in the side via Twitter um, <laughs> regarding uh, Liverpool City Council and what I refer to as an eco-side division. Um, uh, mainly, I, I mean, yeah, with COVID, we had um, obviously grass cutting um, didn't go ahead for a few months earlier on in the year. Um, and there are actually there are actually some really good habitats along that area, along um, Otters Pool and uh, Riverside Drive in particular. Uh, which which go which almost from form a corridor from the city centre out to um, the end of Cressington and almost link up um, with uh, the Speak and Garston Coastal Reserve. And there's a real missed opportunity there. I, I just think about about a little bit of tweaking of the the, the grass cutting um, regime, um, which could actually. Uh, help with climate, help with biodiversity and save the council money. But I'm not getting a response at the moment. It'd be good to have a proper, you know, a, a really good discussion with somebody in there and um, look at best practice elsewhere. That's a really good uh, point and question. I, um, I don't know who specifically generally within the council who might be responsible for that, but um, Juliet Staples is obviously based within the council. So I've mm -hmm. left her email on the chat. Um, so she's worth contacting about that and um, I have been quizzing her about um, the mowing regimes and spraying regimes because obviously it's so important for the pollinators and and yes I have noticed um, personally as well you know it's a real it real it has increased all the habitats having you know unmown verges and things and it's been great seeing all the dandelions and <laughs> everything so it, yeah. it, it is really really important and um, and it does save so much money for the cutting regimes and obviously you know um, about the National Wildflower Centre and um, um, they um, they have over the years obviously they've closed down now at the moment but the, they they have over the years um, planted lots of wildflower patches around Liverpool and um, there's some um, Everton Brow that you've been there there's a lot of huge wildlife flower patches and Islington along Islington Road there's some good patches along there and I found another one the other day just on Sefton Street um, on um, um, a nice big new wildflower patch. So I don't know who's been directly responsible, but obviously that's um, with coordination with the city council, but I don't know who's really responsible for that because it's outside my scope mm -hmm. as a project, but it's definitely worth asking Juliet Staples because um, she might know who to ask. And and it's definitely worth asking about mowing regimes. And I know for the pollinator planting in the Baltic, she really wants to coordinate the, um, the um, what's it called? The, street cleaning services or whatever um the people who do all the mowing and uh, within the council and um to try and coordinate with them uh, so that th they know how to treat the pollinator verges and how to um how to work with them to improve biodiversity so she is very keen to link in with them and um so it's definitely worth asking her she would know a lot more about it and thanks i'll, I'll give it a try yeah yeah, yeah. thanks okay so 
Yeah, I mean, it's great that people, you know, like yourself, Peter, are pursuing these, this with, with the council because they, you know, they, I, I can't imagine, you know, I don't know how many hectares of green space that they own within the, in the city, but it's, it's, it's very significant and, uh, you know, the impact of it is, is great. So. Yeah, I mean, one thing that I hadn't really realised until this spring was, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the first couple of months of the lockdown coincided with drought and there is it was quite amazing seeing that that the longer grass and um, the unmown areas were still green yet mm. once they were mown they, they they were parched they were absolutely parched um and the, the coop there's probably a cooling effect going on there as well as uh storing carbon in, in, the, in the grassland if managed correctly um, so there's a lot, I think there's a lot we can do. Dorset County Council are absolutely on this and some other councils around the, the country as well are very well advised and they manage it very well and they're saving money as well as having lots of biodiversity and, and climate benefits. I, I'd just like to, uh, to uh, uh, just say something there. I, I, I do think that there's opportunities there for City Council to, to, to um, catch up a little bit here because I feel they've, they've fell behind a little bit there and I think I will actually uh, email Juliet now myself personally and, uh, and get onto this now and, and Pete's quite right I think I've seen Peter's tweet it was the same one I'm thinking of and they were cutting the verges uh, cutting the, the grass and the bushes uh, at the wrong time I think it was and uh, I think it was you Peter I'm not sure but uh, yeah I think we can do it a little bit better I think Thank, thanks, William. Um, okay, we'll, we'll move on to a question from um, Leo. That's, an, that's a really interesting discussion, though. So, Stella, have, have, have you noticed any increase in life during lockdown? <laughs> Well, I, I was, um, I, I've only just started the pollinator monitoring again, but there's, uh, I was doing air monitoring all the way through and it was, um, yeah, it was amazing how the roads were so quiet during um, the lockdown and yeah, it was, it was completely like a ghost town in, in the centre and <laughs> yeah, so it's, but uh, with the, um, yeah, but uh, with the pollinators, in terms of pollinators, I, I only started again last month, you know, where it's felt sort of safe enough to go out again to do it and it's um yeah it's uh because obviously I, I i can sort of keep do it on my own but keep away from people but only just it, with the parks being so busy it was quite difficult at one point but um it's um yeah i haven't really looked properly at the data because obviously it's only yeah from june i started again so unfortunately i can't really fully answer that question but um but I, I, as we've just mentioned with the the reduction in mowing um that really helped and yeah i, I think that helped generally and and um like throughout and and yeah it, um but it's and obviously it has sort of helped the nitrogen dioxide levels and things like that so it's um but it's yeah it's um the increase in life i don't know <laughs> yeah I, I mean you do notice that with uh you can hear well you used to be able to traffic levels a bit more up now but you, you could hear hear bird song more and birds weren't having to sing quite as loud to get above the noise of the traffic and yeah, so it's, I have allotment that's fair, fair, well, near a fairly busy road, and it, uh, actually, I mean, I sit near the road, uh, you know, which is wonderful. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's great. yeah, it'll be it'll be really interesting when this this year is reflected on in terms of, let's say, just butterfly transects. I know a lot will have been halted, but you know, mm. a lot less mowing probably is good for things like skippers, and it, and maybe we'll 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 see some interesting trends in, in that. And we had a, a second question from, from Leo. Um, as a parent, have you got capacity to speak in schools and involve children? Oh yes, I'd love to. Uh, yeah, if there's an opportunity, that'd be great. If you can, um, um, I, I, yeah, hopefully the, the project will let me do that. And yeah, I, I, yeah I, I'm, I'm definitely keen to do that. And yeah, spread, uh, just talk about it and yeah, and engage um, uh, children as much as possible in schools yeah um, I've done some previous previous projects of connecting um, doing nature workshops in schools as well and it's great how interested um, and amazing questions you get from all the children which is fantastic and and different viewpoints and <laughs> things like that so which is great so yeah I'm very keen so yeah just uh, if you know of any schools who'd be interested that would be great and then um, yeah so, um, I'll be definitely up for it so yes yeah. <laughs> 
Um, brilliant. Perhaps, Leo, you could send um, Stella your, your details in, in the chat. You can do it, you know, you can do it privately on there. Um, that, that's, that sounds great. Um, just looking through for any more questions. Tony's put some scientific names of butterflies in there for me to uh, <laughs> for. Um, yeah, Red Admiral and Meadow Brown. We're, we're talking about the meadow, the World Museum Meadow here. And looks like a small skipper, I think. Maybe I'm, I can I'm, you can deal with the common names, Tony. If you if you have the gun. No. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll come back to that maybe. Um, um, so a question from Rod. Um, so, did you find a difference with canopy and non-canopy areas for air quality? That's a really good question. Yeah, um, we're actually coordinating with a guy, um, an academic from Birmingham, who um, looks at um, the impact of green infrastructure on um, airflow and um, air quality and like the height of hedges and how that shields. So if a hedge is above head height, if I remember it right, he um, has found then that will shield um, um, the air, um, improve the air quality as a sort of shadow of that hedge from the road as long as the air flow is from the road to the um, over the hedge but you can get eddies and things like that and also as an uh, extra thing you can actually um, reduce air quality by having um, a very dense canopy over a, over a path where it can actually trap air pollution so it's it's a really good question as um, as I as say this um, um, James Levine is his name that he's basically um, so um, he's investigating this so he would know a lot more about this and um, we are um, as part of the points because I'm as, um, we are doing these set points looking at air quality so I'm, I am sort of noting if it's under canopy or not but I haven't analyzed that data yet and that's a really good point to do that and but I can I can put you in contact with James Levine if or you can look him up he's University of Birmingham James Levine um, and he's he's very much a pioneer in this um, look at the impact of green infrastructure on the air flows and air quality. So it's definitely worth asking him questions about that, and I can put you in touch with him. Um, so I was just going to ask, have you have you got these environmental monitoring stuff? Have you had it out throughout lockdown when there would have been less traffic? Um. What do you mean for the um, monitoring or? Uh, yeah, the, the, the um, you know, your test tubes strapped to the trees and things. Oh, the diffusion tubes, yeah. Unfortunately, they, the labs closed at early lockdown, but then they restarted. So they've only just restarted. So we've got, um, I think we've got May's data, but we obviously missed March and April, which is a real shame. So it's, um, so, and I don't know whether the tubes we from May were also out in March and April, so it skews the data a little bit. So. Um, uh -huh. Need to, which is a real shame because the actual labs who analyze the tubes closed down, which is, but they are up again. So which, um, it'd be interesting to see if there is a difference. So uh, yeah, I'm afraid that data is still yet to be analyzed, but <laughs> to look at. So, so yeah. but th there isn't any, any March or April data to, to use? Um, for the diffusion tubes, uh, for the nitrogen dioxide, no, there isn't unfortunately, which is a real shame because uh, it just stopped because the labs um, closed down, so. Yeah, oh, shame it's like a once in a lifetime yeah. chance there to see. Exactly, it was so disappointing. What it can go down to, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's one of those things, unfortunately. <laughs> so, yeah, extreme, um, extreme events. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, yes, it, I said uh, small skipper we've had in the meadow, yes, so I was right with the scientific name of that, which is quite fortunate really. The Rod was just saying just to be careful with the skippers, I know Essex skipper is coming, um, I think maybe is, is Yorkshire the closest ones or I don't know how far they're up north from the south now, um, but yeah, with your I mean, Essex skippers, the, the, the end of the antennae look like they've been dipped, dipped in ink. You need to look from the underside, really. You need to be close up, looking at them head on on the underside of the antennae. And they're, they're black in Essex skipper, um, but they should be 
well, they can be reddish or quite pale in in in, in small skippers. But that's a, that's a good point to be careful with those nowadays because it's not a completely safe bet that it's a, it's a small skipper. Um, in fact, I've been in recent email threads about one, you know, putative sort of pictures of Essex skipper, but they can't, they're not quite certain. They haven't quite got the right views in, in the photographs. Um, that was recently from maybe near Burnley, I think, but no, not, not concrete pictures. Um, uh, is there any more, any more questions or did anyone want to continue any, any sort of discussions around what um, Liverpool City Council might, might be able to do? Any suggestions there that might be passed on to people who, who make decisions about these things? Um, I'll give you... Um, Can I just quickly ask everyone, if, does anyone use iNaturalist already? Or, um... Oh, Mary does, yeah, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that Biobank are quite, they, they use it a lot, don't they? Um, and yeah, and, I, and it's, it's, it's obviously very popular worldwide. Probably, I record is probably the dominant um, um, place that the entomologist, so well, at least the experienced entomologists that I know are, are putting their, their records now. Um, but iNaturalist certainly is, uh, can't be ignored. There's a lot of data, a lot of good data going into there and, and I think they just need to improve the infrastructure in terms of it, of it being verified by national and regional experts and getting, into, getting onto the MBN Atlas and things like that. But it's, it's, a, very, it's a very good interface on there and it's very, yeah, it's, it's, what's, what it's a great place for is putting on records of things that you don't know what they are because there's a is that community sort of um identification help with it whereas i i record you it's, it's you need to really know what it is before you put it on there so um yeah so unless unless there's any other questions um i i think we'll we'll leave it there um for today um but we're gonna we're gonna continue with these um webinars you know all throughout the rest of the year, and we're gonna be trying to do them more and more regularly. Um, but I hope I'll, I'll see some of you out in the field next month. Um, and yeah, please do join the Facebook group and um, I, I, I'll, I'll try and keep, keep an eye on what's going on with, with, the, with the mowing regimes. It's, it is very interesting, I don't know how uh, how, how you sort of keep up to date with it really and, and, and know what their plan is. They must have a big management plan written somewhere um, and, how, and how that's influenced, but um, it, it is really important. So it's, it's great that there's some interest in, in uh, improving that. Um, okay, right, well, I'll, I'll leave it there and hopefully see you all soon. <laughs>